I thought what we could do is stop here and uh, since we, we're going to talk about the paper, let's, let's stop, bring the paper out and let's talk about that for a while. And next time we'll, we'll finish that up and we're going to start in chapter four next time. We'll be done with chapter three. So you might want to read ahead in chapter four and get ready for that. And what we'll do is, can you bring the, do you know how to bring up the sound on the people? Uh, I can try it real quick. Why don't you guys say something down there so they can discuss amongst yourselves. Come on, Laura, say something. Somebody. Me. <laughs> Keep talking. I'm the professor here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the one I've got is this one here, the amperometric uh, microsensor for HRS and the flash and all that. Everybody else is the one, I hope. I didn't screw that up again. Um, any uh, particular questions that people had before I start? I'll have, I had a few questions, but uh, we can, I'll just let it, people ask questions and see what's going on. Can you explain the, the part where you said um, measuring setup and procedure? Mm -hmm. In that beginning that said that um, the microsensor was connected to a homemade Pico ammeter and an internal vortex source, source to polarize um, both working electrode and guard electrode. And what, why do they do that? Right. Well, the, the uh, first, of, well, first of all, let's let's make sure we understand what the title means, and that's often a, important. <laughs> Let me, and then we'll explain that in a minute. But um, what what's that word amperometric mean? Does anybody know what amperometric means? Yeah. So amperometric is a amp got the word amp in it. That's current versus uh, we're measuring current basically. So we're measuring amperometric means we're measuring current, and now. Some sensors, particularly uh, pH sensors, for example, are not amperometric. They're so-called potentiometric sensors. And this is a potentiometric sensor that measures potentials. This one measures amp current. So amperometric current measurement sensors often have to apply a voltage to polarize it to get current to flow. Otherwise, we would just sit at the equilibrium point and not get any current flowing. So microsensor, you know, that's kind of a made up word. That just means a small sensor termination of hydrogen sulfide in aquatic environments. All right, so going back to your question, uh, a pico ammeter is just a, a, a sensitive ammeter. That's a small a current a source that can, or a current measurement device that can measure current down to pico amps, 10 to the minus 12 amps. Um, He's saying, they're saying that uh, they have an internal voltage source to polarize both working electrode and uh, guard electrode. And that just means that there is a um, some sort of a voltage source, a maybe from a battery or something like that, that they can apply 150 millivolts or so. And polar, it needs to be polarized. We use the word polarized to suggest that there is a potential versus the, uh, the counter electrode in that particular case. So the polarization is required to get current to flow. It's, you can think of it as an over potential for that system. And, and without a current, uh, without a potential being applied, we would get no current to flow um, in this particular case. And we need some current flow because how does the how does the experiment work? Can you did you get that? I mean, you can see on scheme one a, a basic diagram of the system. Uh, that'd be on page um, four thirty fifty forty three fifty three. What's the function of the silicone membrane in the system? What's that doing for us? Reaction. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it doesn't really do that. No. It separates um, mm -hmm. to the charge. It make it pass the charge species. Right. Well, let's, let's think about what we're trying to measure. We, they're aquatic environment. They don't really say what they're measuring, but actually what they're probably interested in doing is putting these in uh, either mud 
at the bottom of uh, the ocean or some lake or something like that, and the mud from micro from microorganisms are, is got hydrogen sulfide in it, product of their metabolism. Um, so, what n thinking about it that way? Why would we want a membrane in there in that in that cell? What's that doing for us? Well, we don't want any particulates that are not related to H2S. Right. Impurities and we could just put in a a barrier there, though. We could just put it. So what else what else is that membrane doing for us besides keeping the mud out of it? Making it you know, easier. And in this way H S uh, has to go through an electrochemical reaction at that level. Yeah. Okay, current so well, you see, actually, uh, you see H2S sort of going up to the membrane there, and then it's suggesting that H2S is passing through the membrane, isn't it? Mm -hmm. No, but never gets there. <laughs> 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 right. Mm -hmm. But um, H2S is a gas, actually, a dissolved gas uh, in most cases. It's not a gas that you're seeing, but it's a dissolved gas in solution. So mm -hmm. the H2S is going through the membrane as a gas. So the membrane actually is acting as a, a filter, if you like. It's only allowing gaseous material into the system. And why is that important? Because we don't want to, he doesn't want to measure HS minus or S2 minus. He wants to measure H2S. I should, I'm saying he, maybe it's a she. I don't know. Um, they want to measure H2S, not the other one. So that membrane not only acts as a barrier you know, to keep it clean, but it acts as a, a gas barrier. So only gas diffuses across that barrier. And that's a, there's actually another gas that you might have to worry about uh, in that case, and that would be oxygen. But they actually describe why the oxygen is not considered to be a problem. Mostly the systems are anoxic. They don't have any oxygen present in the bottom of the ocean in the muds. So why don't, why don't they show H2S as being a H2S inside between the membrane and the working electrode on scheme one? What's happened there? It's dynases. Dynases to hydrogen and with uh, hydrogen supply. Right. Um, the, as soon as that H2S gets in the alkaline, sensor solution, it's no longer can be in acid form. It, so it ionizes to HS minus. So that's why they show it uh, as H, uh, S or HS, H plus S double minus. And it also supplies a, a gradient. Uh, there is also always a diffusional gradient. Uh, because there's no H2S inside the membrane, there's always going to be a flux. If there is any H2S outside, it will diffuse readily into that into that system. What's the purpose of the uh, iron, the, this complex iron, Fe, Cn, 6, 3 minus, 4 minus, what's, what are those doing for us? Ferrocyanide. The ferrocyanide is used to oxidize the sulfide ions to sulfur. Yeah. And then the, the solution. Then the ferrocyanide are back, uh, oxidized again. Uh, and in this case, the oxidation current will be proportional to the quantity of sulfide ion present in the medium. Yeah. Well, for our non uh, electrochemist friends, you, the, there's two complexes. There's FeCN63 minus, that's called ferrocyanide. And then the FeCN64 minus is the ferrocyanide. And then the oxidized and reduced form is a complex. It's a stable complex of iron that's often used in electrochemical experiments. Why do they bother? What's the point of having, essentially what you're saying there is a mediated electron transfer. We're, we're making the electrons flow from the electrode or we're, they're pulling them into the electrode from the uh, uh, fer ferrocyanide. And uh, why can't we just uh, skip the ferrocyanide and ferrocyanide and directly oxidize the uh, sulfide. What's the purpose of having that ferrocyanide in it? It seems to be extraneous. It's 
you're measuring the signal, aren't you? That reoxidation. Right. <clears throat> But why couldn't we just measure directly the sulfide sign? It's, uh, it shouldn't make any difference. I mean, you, but basically what you're doing, this is actually often the case uh, that you use a, a mediated process in sensors. And um, what did we talk about today? Why, why might, why might uh, we want to use a mediator rather than a direct process? Kinetics. Kinetics, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, it turns out that the reduction of HS minus to sulfur is slow, very slow on most electrode materials. And not only that, the sulfur will absorb onto the surface and poison the electrode itself. So, so if we used a sensor that tried to directly do the measurement, what would happen is that we, first of all, we'd have to apply a very large overpotential for the reaction to proceed at a significant rate. And also, we'd find that our sensor immediately quit working because it would be poisoned by the sulfur that we make. Okay. So by using a mediator, we avoid that problem. The chemical um, oxidation by uh, ferricyanide with uh, HS minus is much more uh, efficient. It's a much more labile process. It occurs rapidly, and so the kinetics for that is very rapid. And so we can easily then do the process of much lower overpotential. So by using a mediated process, we can uh, minimize the overpotential and also minimize the uh, problem of um, poisoning. All right. So what was the, um, you know, they talked about this, they talked about uh, making it uh, the sensor. And um, notice the, uh, on table one, the features. You can see the, uh, the effect of what the zero current is. You can see that's very small, two to 40 picoamps. Uh, it doesn't, it drifts a little bit, but not too much. What the, but this sensor is still not probably ready for prime time, but they're still developing it, so it, it doesn't work great. Uh, but you can see the limit of detection is about two micromolar, relative standard deviation about 2.5 percent. Does anybody remember how long these uh, these last? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, about last, you can see on figure five, last, according to that figure, lasts about 30, 30 days. It says microsensor, the maximum left in about six weeks. Uh, actually, the uh, couple limitations, one is the stability of the electrode, which will change with time. The other would be the, um, uh, the ferrocyanide itself. Once the ferrocyanide runs out in the sensor, the, it will no longer work properly. And in fact, you really want to, it's not just that it runs out, but you want a high concentration relative to ferrocyanide to get the reaction to, to go. So as soon as the ferrocyanide drops to some small fraction, or some even a big fraction of what it was, it'll, it'll not work properly anymore. You'll need more and more over potential to get the reaction to go. Um, and you can see some other things. I'm not sure. Um, Couple things they had a problem with uh, uh, pH. Look on figure 10. It's on page 4356. Look at uh, you can see the uh, you can see the uh, current potential curve for that with the redox mediator present in the system, and you can see there's an equilibrium potential. Uh, and they, this is actually um, 
I think a German group. Yeah. And uh, so they use uh, U for uh, potential. That's often the case for Europeans, especially Germans use U for that. Uh, but you can see there's an equilibrium point at about 0.22, uh, I guess, 2.22 volts. They were polarizing then at uh, about uh, at 0.2 volts to say 0.42 uh, uh, or something like that. So there's, there's your polarization voltage right there. So you're going from that equilibrium point to a sufficiently uh, positive to get the reaction to occur. You have to be, they wanted to be out on that plateau part of the wave. Okay. We're going to ask ourselves some other questions. We'll see some things later that are important in this paper. One is um, diffusion. Now how, do, how do molecules get from the, somewhere else into that sensor? Have, the molecules have to diffuse in. Will the rate of diffusion have any effect on our sensor performance? And you can, might ask yourself, what would be the situation if we made our sensor bigger or smaller on the signal? Would it necessarily be better to make a bigger sensor than a smaller one? Um, and we'll see some of that later on, uh, what's going to happen. Well, I did have one question Rhonda asked. She, she asked me what the purpose of the guard electrode was. Anybody see that? They, I think on page uh, 43, I remember saying it here. On page 4353, if you look on page, about halfway down it says uh, more details, especially the function of the guard electrode are given elsewhere. And uh, does anybody remember reading that particular part of the paper? Does anybody have any idea what that guard electrode is doing for us? It would be like a reference electrode? Uh, not really. No, um, the oxidation currents measured between the working and the guard. Yeah. We still have the counter electrode. At the beginning, I thought that this would be, this is another name for counter electrode, but I, I figured out there is a counter electrode. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, you, if we thought about a, a, a reference electrode, that would re really be where the CE would be. That would be the counter electrode in this cell. Because we're, usually when we use a reference electrode, we're measuring a potential versus at some point. So by applying the potential that we've applied is really versus that CE point, counter electrode point. It's kind of interesting it, situation. We're measuring the current. We're having the working electrode and the guard electrode essentially at the same polarizing potential. Yeah but we're measuring the current difference between the two. All right. And uh, I never, I didn't read the paper, actually. I don't know exactly why, because uh, in fact, we don't get that paper on campus, so I, I couldn't look it up. But I have a uh, theory, this may be wrong, but my theory is this, is that, um, notice the, uh, how they've drawn it. I think you can see a better you know, picture in figure four. Uh, you can see the guard electrode there. It does not extend all the way to the bottom. The working electrode is very close to the end. Uh, the, the, the space between uh, the working electrode and the membrane they claim is about 40 microns. And uh, the, the space between the working electrode and the guard is about 200 microns. So there's a significant difference in the, um, in the uh, distance between the membrane entrance and the guard electrode. So what, what might you think would happen in that particular case? What would be the importance of having the guard and the working electrode at different positions in the cell? What, what difference would you observe? Is the, the resistance between, would be a difference in the resistance between the... Yeah, there would be a difference in the resistance. What, would that help with the... Uh, 
sensitivity. Remember the guard and the working electrode have the same potential, so the, if there was a resistance difference, that wouldn't really make any difference, would it? What do we think about what we're doing? Okay, what, what's the what's the point of the so what's what's actually going on? Think about it physically. We're measuring H2S. So what's going? What's happening first in that process? Diffuse. Diffuses through the membrane. It undergoes a chemical equilibrium to form HS minus. And then what's it do? Oxidized. Yeah, it gets oxidized. Yeah. And so where's that oxidized molecule at, most likely? Where the guard electrode is. Is it where the guard electrode is? The oxidized molecule. Well, actually, we oxidize the salt. We oxidize the HS minus. And so the ferrocyanide is, uh, is doing that job for us. So we make some ferrocyanide when we do that. So we reduce the ferrocyanide to ferrocyanide. Right? Mm -hmm. So where's the ferry cyanide being formed? Near the guard electrode. Okay, the ferry cyanide is being formed. The working electrode. Being formed from the oxidation of HS minus. So where's the HS minus present? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's near the membrane, right? Mm -hmm. As soon as it gets into the membrane, it goes. So that's where the ferry cyanide is going to be. And so, in order to get a signal, that ferry sign it has to diffuse to the working electrode and become oxidized again. And uh, um, ferro yeah. And then, uh, so the guard, I think what's happening is that the guard electrode is kind of a, uh, keeps the spatial resolution okay. In other words, it acts as a, stable point. None of the species that are coming in out of the membrane are really getting up to where the guard is ever at. And if it did, the guard would act still as a stable point. So there's a baseline current, and the, um, but we're only measuring the current difference between the working electrode and the guard electrode. So the working electrode is there right near the membrane so they will pick up the, the uh, reduced species and oxidize it and um, I guess I should I should say the ferrocyanide. The ferrocyanide is formed at the there we go. Well I guess we're out of time. So let's uh, stop and, um, and uh, the next uh, paper is on the web page. I don't know if I handed that one out or not. I think it was one we handed out. So is on the web page. I don't know if I handed that one out or not. I think it was one we handed out. So.